We're super happy to have two speakers. We have Roger from um, Cambridge and we have Meng Chang from um, the University of Chicago is here in person <laughs> in Peyton. Um, since it's already late for Roger, um, I would suggest we start with him. Um, and I think um, beyond that, there's nothing much else for me to say that just like take it away. And thank you so much for coming today. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Roger. Let me quickly share my screen. Can you see my screen? Wonderful. Great. So I'm Roger. I'm a final year PhD student in Cambridge, uh, working with Steve, Will and George. And today I'll talk about um, the CMB stuff that I've been thinking out on about on the past. And um, I'm splitting my time between CMB and Lyman Alpha stuff. So today I want to think, talk a bit more about likelihood approximations for large scale CMB data, why we need it, um, what is the problem with large scale CMB data and to give a future outlook where the journey is going to. So first a bit of motivation. So large angular sky CMB data is quite heavily noise and systematics dominated in polarization. And there's no exact analytic likelihood um, in our case. So why, how can we make reliable and unbiased inference in that regime? Um, and as, since we also have a very limited number of simulations, so the end-to-end -end simulations in this case from, for example, the Planck collaboration, um, one has to think about how to wisely use them to set up the noise covariance matrices, etc. Um, so this is the problem setting. And the large angular scale CMB data is particularly important for two main reasons. One, it gives us a good handle on the optical depth to reionization parameter tau, which itself is then important or degenerate um, with several other parameters as the sum of neutrino mass, masses, AS, NS, sigma eight. So when having kind of, when having a better handle on tau, we can also get a better handle on these other parameters. And the other thing is, and that's where the future CMB surveys is going, are going to look for, is to measure primordial gravitational waves parameterized by the tensor to scalar ratio R. That would give us an energy scale for inflation and measure uh, gravitational waves, hopefully. Um, so these are the physical motivations why we're looking at these data sets. And our approach was twofold. So one, to look at an improved noise and systematics modeling approach. So how can we account for the systematics and the data in the form of noise covariance matrices? But I'm not going to focus on that part today. I'm more going to focus on the inference framework part. And there we're looking at three different methods. One is a likelihood approximation scheme based on maximum entropy approach. And the two others are simulation based approaches or recently that have been called as well likelihood free inferences. However, I would be, I would be a bit careful with the name likelihood free since they still somehow need a likelihood. Um, so before diving into the details, a very brief history of the universe. So the optical depth describes the end of the epoch of recombination and the beginning of the reionization phase. So recombination happened around the redshift of 1100 and reionization happens here in the tens of um, redshifts. And then our universe is roughly fully ionized around the redshift of seven, which we know from the absence absence of gun peterson troughs in high redshift quasars. And tau is then the percentage of CMB photons that rescattered since the coupling at recombination. So this is a quantitative measure of when emitting sources such as stars, for example, began forming and reionizing the abundant neutral gas in the universe. That's the kind of the, the key interest or the what tau tells us. Um, and now going to the data that we're looking at. So first, let's have a look on the left-hand panel of the of this slide. There I'm plotting in temperature and polarization, the theoretical angular power spectrum for the largest multiples. So um, the lower the multiple, the larger the scales that we're looking at. And in red and blue, you can see what happens when varying the input param or the theoretical parameter tau. So 
in temperature, basically nothing happens. And in TE and the EE spectra, you see that varying tau results also is reflected in a change of the theoretical angular power spectrum. Um, and if you look at the gray shaded areas, these are the uncertainties on the power spectrum measurements coming from the Planck um, power spectrum. So when trying to constrain tau with these data sets, it's basically impossible using TT only or TE because the cosmic variance is so large. But when looking at EE, one can see that we can start to do model differentiation here and that the information is mainly stored at the largest multiple, so between two and 10. And our approach here is to not only use EE, but to do a combined joint likelihood analysis of temperature and polarization data. In principle, one could use all the data available and all the data mixtures that one could think of. But what we did here is to do 100 cross 143, so take two frequencies, uh, measure their cross spectra, since there the noise is uncorrelated, and we might have a better handle on the noise, and then measure tau on those. On the right-hand side, um, we see the same pictures on the left-hand side, just for the actual data. And the difference between the red and the blue points, so blue is the Planck 2018 legacy release data, and red is SROL2, which is just an updated map making algorithm um, of Planck. And the differences between the two are mainly or are only in polarization. So these are the data sets that we're going to use to make inference on tau. And as you can see, the data jumps around quite heavily. There's quite a lot of noise and systematics in that. So how can we make reliable inference? And therefore, let me quickly recap what Bayesian inference is all about. So in general, you have your posterior that is given proportional to your likelihood and your prior. But in order to get a posterior out of it, you have to somehow manipulate your raw maps that you have in the input. So what you do first is you take the high resolution, high resolution CMB map, compress them to some sort of summary statistic. In this case, we use the power spectrum as summary statistic, but one could in principle also do map-based level inference. This just becomes very in computationally intensive or think about other interesting summary statistics, either higher order endpoint correlation fun functions, bi spectrum, et cetera, or new summary statistics like neural network-based compression. Then you determine the unknown parameters of your model, a given some model, in this case tau, and you generate mock data in pairs. Nothing too new so far. And the likelihoods that we developed and want to compare here are two sets of methodologies. So the left-hand panel is the class of simulation-based likelihood, and on the right-hand side is a likelihood approximation scheme. So let's focus on the simulation-based likelihood first. There, the general assumption is that we have some sort of functional form for the distribution of spectra, and that we can fit somehow this functional form. And in the most basic case called Symbal, that was something that has been developed by the Planck collaboration used already, they just assume that these spectra follow some polynomial. So you fit um, the polynomial to your simulations or to the power spectra of your simulations, and then evaluate this polynomial at the data, giving you your likelihood. So this is a very basic concept of simulation-based inference. Then a novel approach from Justin Alsing and others is the so-called density estimation likelihood free inference, which I would just call a generalization of the simulation-based likelihood. Here again, you assume a functional that some functional form for, uh, the, um, fits the distribution of spectra, but you don't impose which functional form it has to be. So in the Symbal case, it is a third order polynomial that you assume, and here you just say, I can fit it using a family of functions. And therefore, what we're trying to, to do is to, to find an invertible mapping F from our power spectra to a variable UL, which is um, a Gaussian random variable. And then our likelihood would be trivial to evaluate as we have some sort um, some multidimensional Gaussian times a Jacobian, which is just the transformation. And the tricky part here is to find that mapping F. And therefore, we use a neural network-based approach to, to fit this. 
but we don't know how f should look like in principle. One could impose constraints by saying, hey, this should be a third order polynomial or something else, but here we give it complete freedom. And what is interesting with this um, mapping is that we, it has to, we impose it um, that it is bijective. So we can, on one hand, evaluate the likelihood using this normalizing flow approach, but on the other hand, also draw samples from the latent space, meaning we can generate a large number of simulations very cheaply. This has a few drawbacks um, when trying to generate simulations, but people are trying to work on that and the accuracy is not that bad until now. So that is quite a promising avenue to generate simulations. So this is all about the simulation-based likelihood. And now going to the likelihood approximation scheme, this is based on the principle of maximum entropy. And here, instead of using a large suite of simulations, the only thing we need is a noise covariance matrix. And then we compute our likelihood by computing moments of the data. And there, in the, there are two methods where, how you can do that. One is analytically, so you don't need any simulations at all, or you do it as well simulation-based. But here we restore, resort to the analytic approach to have a different method that we want to compare. And then to, um, to construct your approximate sampling your distribution, or the one that you then constructed, you evaluated that data, giving you the likelihood. And by integrating it along um, in parameter space, you get the change in your log likelihood, and there you can see what are your maximum likelihood values in your parameter space. So these are the three approaches that we'll call sim to sim low, pi alpha, and momentum. And this all sounds quite nice in theory, but does it actually work? So first of all, let's look at simulations, how these, this looks, looks like. So taking realistic end-to-end -end simulations only for polarization data, we see on the left-hand panel that all three methods beautifully agree. So we, don't have, uh, we can recover the input tau of 0.06 to very high accuracy, and the standard deviation between our maximum likelihood value is quite similar for all three methods. And what we want to understand plot it here and some posteriors from many what is the plot sorry what is, can you say what's the plot i didn't understand this curves there are the different posteriors what well, what is going on here ah yeah so each line here so we have the three methods so the first line is method one second line is another method third line is the third method and each black line is the posterior for tau on one simulation so we take a full end-to-end -end simulation with realistic noise and systematic properties from the Planck collaboration and feed in a fiducial cosmology with a tau of 0.06. And we want to see how well can we recover where we know what the input tau is, given these realistic noise and systematic simulation. And so the 100 black lines per panel show us then the distribution of our posteriors. And the mean of those posteriors gives us nicely the input tau that we inputted in the simulations. And the, uh, the error quoted behind is the standard deviation between the maximum likelihood values of each posterior that we're plotting here. Okay, thank you. And what we wanted to understand is since in the left-hand picture, it looks like they all do the same thing. Do they pick up the same tau for each simulation? And if you look at the right hand plot, so there are three, so it's a bit of a busy plot, but first focusing on the green pluses here, which are have a perfect correlation, which is C similar versus Pi Delphi. So the two simulation based approaches that we have here. And we see that the both models pick up the same tau for, bo for both approaches. However, if you look at Memento, so the maximum entropy approach compared to the simulation-based approaches, we still have a good correlation, but we see a bit of jumping around. So it looks like that the maximum entropy approach picks up a different tau from different simulations, whilst the mean of our simulations or the mean of our posteriors stays the same. So that's something that we're still investigating at the moment to see what's going on here. Um, we haven't fully understood it, why they're not picking up 
the same information from the same simulation. Um, so here, just take this point, for example, the input, um, one model thinks that this is a tau of 0.055, and the other model thinks that this is a tau of 0.045. So there's quite a big, larger than one sigma discrepancy between the two methods. Um, and that's something we're trying to understand at the moment, why we get different results. But overall, it does look like we're recovering the same thing for the different methodologies. Now, going further, as I said earlier, we are looking, we're using all the data available. So we're doing a joint analysis of temperature and polarization data. And this is shown as the red posterior here. And if you only look at polarization data, so the EE information that you see here, this is the posterior just next to it. And we can shrink the error bars by five to 10% by using the additional information from temperature. However, one has to be a bit careful when doing this in the context of simulation-based inference or likelihood-free inference. Since the likelihood-free approach has a, quite a lot of difficulties when scaling to higher dimensional problems. So here we're going from a 30 dimensional problem in EE, so the lowest multiples, to three times 30. So 30 multiples in TT, 13 TE, and 13 EE. And therefore, the likelihood free approach requires an additional compression step. An additional compression step always means that we might lose additional information. And in this plot, you can see how each individual data set or power spectrum contributes to the final result. And EETE seems to um, constrain tau more or less, but TT doesn't give anything, basically. And looking at the compression, how much information we lose, we did the same thing now for a lower dimensional problem where we don't need the additional compression step, but can do the actual um, posterior using this likelihood free approach. And the dotted line is the case with compression. The dashed line is the case without compression. And as a reference, we are showing the full case um, in the solid line. And we see that using compression, we get wider posteriors. By eye, it doesn't look to be dramatic, but looking at the maximum likelihood values and the, um, and the arrow bars, we have between five and 10% wider posteriors when adding additional compression in there. So this was now all in the low multiple large angular scale regime. Combining this with a higher likelihood, we see these different improvements in this plot here. So the contour plot gives in gray to the biggest area in the back for SROL1, so the Planck 2018 data, the default recovered value for tau. Now using switching on for EE, our likelihood, we obtain the red. Um, contours, so tau is pushed to higher values, which is consistent with astrophysics, which constrains tau to be at least 0.04. And then turning on the temperature and polarization correlations, tau moves slightly upwards and shrinks again, and we get for Planck 2018 or SRO2 results of 0.055 or 0.06. Um, so these 0.06 tuba uh, posterior is then the, the go-to value now for the tau constraint since the SROL2 maps also have been improved and, and polarization. So, Roger, could you just comment, so the, the improvement from gray to red is the data improvement. Is the what, sorry? Well, it, I'm just trying to get my head around it, but it's the, it's the improvement coming from data rather than the method here, right? No, so the, the data is exactly the same in this plot. So from gray, the only thing that we're changing is the low multiple likelihood that we're using. So the gray is the default Planck case, high L Planck likelihood and low L Planck likelihood. But with and the SROL data? For the SROL1, so Planck 2018. Okay, fine, got it, got it, okay, thanks. The SROL2 number that I quote here is not plotted in the contour plot, it's just quoted for completeness so that you can compare what does SROL1 versus SROL2 mean. And here from gray to red, 
we switch on one component in our likelihood. And from red to blue, we switch on temperature and polarization in our likelihood and throw away the low L Planck likelihood. Yeah. And, and so another question is, is the TE, I might be wrong, but is was there not a sense that the TE was not trustworthy from the Planck analysis? Like, so, the why it wasn't used, right? so the TE isn't used in the low L Planck analysis yeah. and they discarded it because they thought oh, there were quite a few problems in the um, in the TE spectra that they have so they just threw it out altogether. Mm -hmm. but, so, you're, so you're saying you're wrapping it in but you're not sure that doesn't say it could still have the same problems is that? It still could have the problem but given that at the power spectrum level, it seems quite consistent and um, in the posterior level, that doesn't seem to be anything crazy going on. We have quite a lot of confidence in that using TE information as well. Thank you. So this is so far so good. So this is now the, the tower results that we got. And the question is, what now? And where could we refine this analysis? And of, obviously the data could improve, um, <clears throat> but one key aspect here that I haven't touched upon is foregrounds. And especially for measuring primordial gravitational waves, foreground will become very important since we're trying to measure tiny, tiny signals. How do we deal with foregrounds at the moment? We just subtract constant templates of high and low frequency data, where we assume that low frequency data traces synchrotron and high frequency data tra traces dust. But in the new foreground cleaning approach that we are trying to use here, that's also building upon Joe's, Joe's work from WMAP and other people earlier, um, where Joe did it in a Gibbs sampling context, we assume that <clears throat> the foreground contaminants of synchrotron and dust can be modeled as power laws in frequency space. And what we are doing here is now to use a newton raphson approach where we include correlations between noisy pixels and we impose a spatial correlation length in the prior so we assume that the beta so the spectral indices that um, govern the power laws of our contaminants can vary across the sky in a somehow continuous fashion so instead of saying Pixel one and pixel a neighboring two neighboring pixels can have completely different spectral index um, values. They have to have some sort of smooth smoothness across the sky, and this is then the new likelihood that we're looking at. So, the first part is just as has been looked at uh, quite often before, and the second part is a prior term where in the second noise covariance matrix we include the spatial correlation length in the prior. And this is something that we've just, so this is current work um, where we looked again at the SROL2 data to see, do we measure any spectral index variations across the sky? And does that give us any a better handle on foregrounds? And the six maps that I'm showing here, uh, so the top row is the spectral index for synchrotron, so the power law index. And the bottom panel is the same for dust. And here we have three columns. The right case is where we treat every pixel independently. So there's no noise correlations between the pixel and no prior correlations. And the left column is where we turn on both of these correlations, correlated noise plus correlated prior. And what we're interested in is seeing first, can we see any patterns? So how does the spectral index vary? And second, is there any spectral index variations? And what we measure is we get a significantly wider distribution of spectral indices than what has been currently done. And we give it very, very wide priors as an input. So we start off with an initial guess, gradually increase the priors, and we can measure spectral index. We see a clear evidence for spectral index variation in synchrotron, but not in dust. And these spectral index variations coincide with the loops in the maps. And these loops are, is a filamentary structure in our um, in the CMB sky, which coincides with supernovae 
which are remnants from supernovae. And um, we measured tau using these, this information from the foreground maps. So cleaning the C, large angular scale CB data using this procedure, and we get consistent, roughly consistent tau constraints. So that means that for the Planck data, we're basically reaching the limit of what the Planck data can tell us. But for future large angular scale data, so for example, Lightbird, this will become quite relevant to first measure tau and r in an unbiased way, but also get a better handle on foregrounds. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm in my when I'm not thinking about the CMB, I'm mainly thinking about Lyman Alpha or compression of large scale structure surveys. So I'm happy also to, to chat about these topics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the very nice talk and for keeping on time. That was wonderful. <laughs> so uh, we have five minutes. So are there any questions? I, I was just wondering if you go, could go back at the slide that had the three methods. Um, this one? Before, like the actual, yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah. Is there... Um, so in this low sim thing, you seem to be uh, taking the likelihood of each L as independent. Is that yeah. correct? It is an assumption that you can make when using a quadratic maximum likely estimator for the low L um, regime. And we tested that. In the, sky, you... in the full sky though. In the... Or not. Well, even for a mass sky, it is an approximation, yes, but we assume the different Ls to be independent. But not in the other, not in, in Delphi, it seems that's not the case. What about in the, I didn't quite follow the math of this uh, maximum entropy. Is, is a similar approximation being made? So in the maximum entropy approach, you also use the power spectrum of your data. So, um, and there you use a You don't use this, you can account better for correlations between uh, the multiples and the different data sets. So you can correlate between TT, TE, and EE, which you cannot do easily in the Symbal approach. Um, so the Symbal assumes the highest degree of independence between your different um, data points, which in the maximum entropy approach, you don't do in the same way. But with a QML estimator, you assume somehow L1, the Ls to be weakly correlated. And is there any way of just looking at this? I mean, at the end of the day, there are functions of 30 variables, right? So yeah. So you could plot them as a function of one of them, or so even though, yeah, is there any way of looking at them just to see what L is making most of the difference when you, why is it that you are off this line of one to one? Is it from, from because of some low L? Is it because of what is it about? Is, is there something you can do? Yeah, so the, the key, so yeah, so we looked at what is the most influential L or most influential L range that um, govern, gives you the, the tau constraint and reducing the L range further and further gives us better information on what the actual method is actually picking up. Mm -hmm. um, and the tightest or kind of the most information is stored in L3456. Um, so when going to that regime, the different methods become similar and similar. So this gives us, gave us confidence that they're actually doing the right thing. But the moment you go back- uh, to, you, you found some difference between your moment and the other thing. So if it's yeah. just the, the first five, three L's or something or four, could you, do you know more about you could look at those functions, the function of those and see what's going on or? That's true, yeah, we haven't looked at that more in detail and just, um, so we did the same plot for different L ranges to see if anything is going wrong when restricting or increasing the L range. So this is for the maximum L range, two to 30. 
When going further down in L ranges, so the, the main multiples, this becomes more and more correlated between the methods. In the end, you decided to use this moment, moment as opposed to the other things, but from this plot, you would think maybe I should be more suspicious about it because it looks not to agree with the other two. Well, one could read it that way, yes, but our interpretation is one that C Simlo and Pi Delphi are doing exactly the same thing. One is just a generalized method of the other. They are quite strongly dependent on the simulations that you're using. Um, and what we didn't want to do is to use this black box neural network approach from Pi Delphi, and we wanted to rather have a different approach where there's more physical insight on A, how to account for correlations between uh, the different, uh, so the temperature and the polarization data, and B, how to also account for correlations between your power spectrum multiples, um, which you can't do in the same way with the simulation-based inference. Mm -hmm. And also for numerical robustness and speed, momentos superior to the two other methods, that was also an additional reason. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let me jump in. I think um, we're at one o'clock. So I would say in the interest of time, let us um, first of all, thank Roger again for a very nice talk and for answering all of our questions. And if there are more questions, please let's try to maybe um, save them for after or um, for an email to Roger. So having said that, um, I think it's time to head over to our second speaker. So please take it away. So, uh, mute myself. Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Mei Chanling uh, from uh, University of Chicago. Uh, I'm a PhD student now uh, working with uh, Wayne Hu. And uh, thank you for having me uh, here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the solutions for the um, edge not tension. Um, so, first, I will introduce the hub tension, which I think is already familiar to most of you. And then I will talk about uh, uh, the current proposed solution and uh, how they tie to the CMB physics. And also uh, 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 the uh, approach for the better solution in future, we will also talk about. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, so the actual tension is basically the current tension between the early and late universe measurement about the uh, actual value. So here I show uh, the current uh, high precision measurement of the H naught. And here is the early time measurement and then here is late time measurement. Uh, so overall speaking, uh, we have about five sigma tension uh, between these. And then this has become uh, a more, more significant mystery in modern cosmology. So um, before I talk about the proposed solution, uh, I would like to first talk about how we infer actual value from an early time measurement and CMB measurement. So we measure CMB um, at in print uh, at recombination. So there are two quantities that uh, are important here. One is the sound horizon at recombination. And another one is the angular diameter distance. Uh, from today to recognition. So from a simple geometric relation, uh, we can uh, get their ratio to be the angular size, uh, which is well measured by the observed CMB peaks. So we can measure this angular size and given a cosmology model, we can calculate this uh, sum horizon so we can infer this distance and hence the actual value. 
So this is how we get additional value from uh, early time, and we compare this to the uh, late time local measurement, and we get tension. Okay, so from uh, this sketch, uh, we can easily see there could be generally uh, two types of solution. One is the late time solution, which you only change the late time extension history. And the other one is the early time solution, which you can, in principle, also change the sound price. So let me talk about the late time solution first. Um, this type of solution can be realized, for example, by the various dynamical late uh, dichotomy model. So in this type of solution, uh, you could change uh, actual value itself, but generically, uh, it will be very hard to fit the whole distance ladder uh, to BL to CMB hyper flow. So in the end, I would say this type of solution uh, do not work well. So um, I'm not going to focus on this type of solution. And instead, uh, let me talk about the early time solution. So um, straightforward thought is uh, to add additional radiation like component. So you will increase the total energy density before recombination, uh, hence you lower the sound horizon. So from the previous relation, you know, uh, once you lower the sound horizon, you will invert a higher edge not solution. Uh, it looks nice. Uh, and uh, uh, it can be realized by, I call this free streaming dark radiation model, a type of model which is equivalent to change the effective neutrino number. So in this type of model, uh, you have the additional radiation uh, all the time. So uh, for example, the stereo neutrino model uh, is a, a natural uh, realization. So, so far it looks good, but uh, you will have a problem with the damping scale, which is also well measured by the CMB. So in this type of model, you generally have the damping scale uh, scale as the square root of the sound horizon. So you will change the ratio of the sound horizon and the damping scale. So you are going to screw up the fitting to CMB because CMB measure both of these. So for this reason, uh, the free streaming like radiation model do not work uh, as well. So um, in 2018, um, early dark energy uh, model was proposed um, by um, Pulling et al. So um, they proposed to add a dark fluid that is only important uh, near recombination. So by doing so, you can keep the ratio of the salt horizon and the damping scale unchanged. And still, you reduce the uh, salt horizon. So you have the high channel solution and also uh, didn't uh, screw up the same So um, uh, the background uh, story is simple, but the perturbation is also important here if you want to Still fit the same B. So in their model, you actually need to tune the uh, initial phase of the uh, EDE scale field uh, to get things right. So I will go back to this later. Uh, okay. So in spite of um, this early dark energy model, um, together with um, uh, John Paolo Benevito, uh, Wayne Hu, and uh, Mark Ravery, uh, we propose an acoustic dark energy model uh, with a simple scale field realization. So here, uh, we only need a, a power law potential um, connect with a, a flat potential uh, to solve this uh, action of tension. So, so in the early um, universe, uh, the Hubble parameter is large. So it acts uh, as a large friction. 
uh, which makes uh, the signal field stuck at its potential. So as the universe expands, uh, uh, the Hubble parameters uh, reduce. So uh, it will release from the uh, Hubble drag at a certain point and start rolling uh, to convert the potential energy to the kinetic energy. And uh, uh, it just uh, stay in the kinetic dominant phase uh, uh, in the end. So in order to um, fit the data, we actually need the uh, convergence happen at matter radiation equality. And uh, this is also the key um, of the, um, this model. So I want to emphasize here, so this specific format of potential is not uh, strictly required to solve the uh, potential. So as long as you have the potential energy convert quick enough to kinetic energy at matter radiation quality, you can solve uh, actual potential. So, okay. um, so in this model, uh, it has also uh, the um, fractional energy that is uh, only important near matter radiation equality and it redshift away uh, quickly. So uh, from the same like, background story to a little energy, you can sum up uh, potential. So in order to further investigate the um, important perturbation behavior, uh, I will also introduce the um, equi equivalent fluid distribution for this model. So you have the uh, equation of state change from uh, minus one, which is dark energy, um, from the final value called WF, and the transition just happen at uh, equality. And also you will, uh, uh, we have the uh, red frame sound speed uh, uh, to encode the perturbation uh, behavior. And uh, for the, uh, simplicity, we just uh, make it a constant uh, here. So, uh, so by doing so, when you fit it to the data, you get this nice degeneracy plot for the WF and the uh, sound speed. So uh, this is a generic uh, requirement for all the uh, early dark energy light models. Uh, for example, uh, in the original EDE model, you actually have this um, correlation uh, between the initial phase and the, the sound speed. So that, that, that is why uh, in the model, uh, you need to tune the initial phase to get everything work. Okay, and, and go back to um, the acoustic deck entry model. Uh, you actually can reduce the tuning. So you will see uh, the data favors uh, WF equal to uh, CS square point here. And uh, this is just a natural result of uh, keeping the uh, square field to be uh, kinetic energy dominate in the end. So we don't have oscillation features. So it's just uh, a, a natural result. And uh, um, more interestingly, the kinetical model, which uh, you have the like, kinetical kinetic energy term, uh, well within the one sigma uh, contour, which is the white point here. So in this kinetical model, uh, in the end, we only have two free parameter, uh, the time of um, the um, transition and the um, total fractional energy. So with two additional free parameter, uh, we can have a high edge not solution and also uh, fit the data well even a better fit to CMB itself. Okay. Um, so in a follow-up paper, we also study the impact of the latest ACT data, which um, yeah, Princeton uh, <coughs> is well involved in, in this ACT collaboration. Um, so, um, so first, uh, I would say this kinetical ADE model passed the ACT constraint 
uh, to relieve the actual tension. And also, if you fit egg together with plank, uh, the fit is still dominated by plank. But uh, uh, interesting point here, uh, if you ignore the plank polarization data, you actually have a very high edge knot solution. And uh, this is consistent with the latest egg uh, paper about the uh, early time energy. Right. Um, so uh, to investigate uh, where the plank polarization data prevent uh, the fit to the uh, uh, to, to the uh, very high edge knot solution, uh, we have this uh, cumulative chi square. Uh, for the Planck TTTEE -E -E, uh, likelihood. So you will see um, the chi square just increase uh, dramatically around this region. And, uh, um, and this region is actually uh, a physical in interesting region because uh, that's the mode enter the horizon near matter region quality, which is particularly the uh, ADE model, uh, how mm -hmm. ADE model works. And uh, uh, it will be sensitive to the uh, microphysics uh, of the acoustic oscillation. And the polarization data is actually much clearer than the um, TT data uh, to investigate the uh, microphysics. Because in TT, you will have the contamination from ice W deck, for example. So uh, I would say in the future, this um, data in this region will be particularly uh, very interesting to distinguish um, all the uh, EDE like model and the lambda scale. And uh, interestingly, we actually see a minor tension between X and Planck in this region, in the TE spectrum. So um, you will see um, the act data have um, oscillatory feature uh, here, but um, you don't see that from Planck data. So um, this um, I use this the lambda TM uh, model as a reference. Um, okay, so so far uh, it looks like a, a, a very good solution, but it has a, a shortcoming. <laughs> so the biggest shortcoming is uh, you will have the positive uh, H0 and the S8 correlation in this uh, early technology like model. And, uh, uh, and in this end, it was the S8 tension uh, already in lambda CM. So S8 is the, uh, uh, the clustering amplitude so, uh, yeah, so, uh, um, so people are still looking for a better way to avoid this uh, shortcoming. So in uh, our most re recent work, which uh, it will come up soon in one week. So we consider um, dark energy and dark matter interaction model. So here uh, you have the dark uh, matter and couple to the whatever early dark energy like field. So in this model, uh, uh, yeah, so then together with uh, Evan uh, uh, uh Colin here and Wen uh, and Shen uh, uh, Zhou. Yeah. So in this model, we will have the dark um, matter mass change uh, with time. So, so the naively uh, expectation is you, it's possible to uh, have this model to suppress the large scale structure density growth. So, hence you will lower the SA value. So, you can solve uh, both actual tension and SA tension uh, in simultaneously. And this is actually uh, our original motivation for this project. But in the end, you will see uh, uh, it's actually not work 
uh, Manuel, and I will show you why. So uh, actually, you will have um, two opposite effects on the density growth. So here I show the density growth, uh, just uh, the co-documented density. Um, so the first effect is, is the early time effect, uh, which uh, is meet our expectation. So uh, because you have the uh, documented mass change, you shift the matter duration quality. So you can either advance or delay the density growth. So you will, in the end, uh, you will have a, a documented density uh, increase or decrease compared to uh, the uh, this uh, early dependency model. So if C equal to zero, it's basically just the early dependency model. But uh, the other effect is uh, for the late time effect. So actually in this model, you will um, have a fixed force uh, on the dark matter. So uh, you will see the effective uh, gravitational coupling is uh, one plus uh, a term that is proportional to c square. So you know for uh, uh, for both positive and negative uh, coupling, you will always have the uh, density growth. So it will always increase the uh, uh, density in the end. So. Uh, so you have two opposite effects uh, compete each other here, and in the end you will have a limited, a limited uh, ability to lower the SA value. So I would say in this model, you will still have the high H0 solution, but you will have the SA value that is uh, more or less the same as the lambda CDM value without large scale approach data. So uh, you can, if you want to solve the SA tension, uh, you, you can do it in this model, but you can at least not worse than lambda CDM. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and uh, also I would say uh, this uh, ability is depend on the um, specific format of the uh, early dark energy uh, potential. So if you use a different potential, it's possible to change the ratio of these two effects. So that would be uh, in the like, future in that case. So you still have to, uh, room to, to do it better. Okay, so for, for the future, um, we, we still, need this early dark energy like background to uh, have a high H0 solution if you want to solve it in this way. Um, but there is still room to address the perturbation and it's also important. And I, as I say, uh, one way is the uh, via the dark interaction. For example, dark energy dark matter interaction, all the other type of interaction, whatever interaction, you, you are uh, changing the perturbation uh, to have it work better. And uh, um, another way that I don't have time today to um, go to detail it is a via the dark force. So for example, the modified gravity. So in our previous uh, work, we show the uh, modified gravity before accumulation uh, could actually uh, relieve the actual tension with a lower acid value. Uh, in perturbation level. And it's uh, through a totally different mechanism uh, because it's changed, uh, you have the gravity change. So you change the um, uh, free the um, baryon acoustic oscillation physics. So uh, yeah, so, uh, so it's possible to have this uh, model combined with um, uh, early dark energy light background to have a better solution. Okay, um, so in future, I'd say uh, uh, we're still uh, 
uh, I was still looking for um, better um, actually pension solutions. And also, I'm also uh, interested in some gravitational um, wave uh, thing as a cosmology probe. Uh, so we have done uh, with the collaborators um, about the um, gravitational wave propagation uh, due to the uh, modified um, gravity. So we have already shown um, in this framework, you will get some interesting phenomenon like um, some echoes from the same gravitational source and some waveform distortion that uh, you can already use this feature to test modified gravity with the current uh, gravity wave data. So I will summarize my work here. And uh, um, uh, maybe the rest time uh, for questions. Thank you very much for your talk. And thank you also very much for keeping on time. Um, are there any questions? So I have a question about the scales, actually. Mm. So you say that a polarization data, and I think you highlighted, and I think Colin has too, that actually may be lower, like L of about a thousand in polarization. What am I saying? What, where, which scales do you, better, do you want better data? Uh, yeah, so particularly this scale. Yeah. So yeah, as I say, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, sensitive to the uh, uh, microphysics of the uh, acoustic energy model because uh, we know in acoustic energy model or early dark model, um, it's only important near uh, matter ratio equality. And uh, this around at around 500 ish is corresponding to the mode like enter the horizon near matter region equality. Mm -hmm. So, physically, this is the most interesting feature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also, that's the, the good thing is, is that that scale is inaccessible in temperature from the ground, but it is accessible, did you say, Adrian, <laughs> from the ground in polarization? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about this, Bluff. Uh, can you remind me again how I should read this? So if I, yellow is, is still including act, but just removing Planck yes. polarization. Yes. And so you see that the, the fit becomes worse uh, as function of L, basically. So yellow. yeah, so uh, I don't fit to Planck polarization data here. Mm -hmm. So the fix. Uh, is pretty bad to plant polarization as you see here, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, uh, if you think um, plant and the act have tension in the polarization data, and uh, the question is, uh, which one you trust more? But if that, I mean, I, we don't think it's significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a minor tension. Yeah, right. what, what significance would you put it at? Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree it's not significant yeah. uh, under lambda scale, but it's actually really different under uh, early dark energy or acoustic dark energy model. Yeah. As also, uh, I think, point out from Colin's okay. paper. Yeah, yeah, no, no, sure. So yeah. here, yeah. it yeah. looks not like significant because I use the lambda CM as a reference. But if you go to the early dark energy model, it becomes really significant. And uh, uh, I would say Planck and ACT data uh, have tension in early dark energy model. And if you say uh, that you just ACT and uh, you ignore Planck, like just for now, then you will fail, the data will favor uh, the early dark energy model. Mm -hmm. And have a very high actual solution. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, I have um, a nice thing. So, if you're doing so, 
you can also fit the PTE oscillate, oscillatory residual in front, which is uh, related to the A line tension. So, if, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah. I have some questions about this potential small tension again. Mm -hmm. um, when you say that the reason it doesn't look so powerful in this plot is because there is you're comparing it against lambda CDM. Um, if I look at that enough, it looks like there are about twice as many point data points as there are active points. Yes. Or so. So yes. if you just throw, if you had the same number of data points, will we still expect that to exist or be stronger or weaker? Um, I'm not sure actually. So you will see, so plant still has a smaller error bar here. So, uh, if you, it does. So it becomes kind of root two. I, I think there are roughly two dip cycles per act. Yeah. Again, I'm just doing this by uh, Yeah, that's a lot of So they'd be root two smaller, actually, right? Yeah. I mean, Plank is better. Plank, the Plank data are currently still better. Yeah. 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 Than X. I think the tension would increase. Yeah. It or, or, well, I mean, you, you can account for it. Yeah. So it won't change, but so yeah, actually looking for the for the future improvement. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you could just like sort of randomly throw away half of the orange right now and so do something. There's probably a much more smarter prescription. So if you take a random sampling of the orange points inside that circle or the oval, you know, would it still be like a root two? Or so when you're receiving to get rid of half of them. I'm just curious, like how that looks. More act release data. Trying to fix everything. Also, <laughs> with these very nice last words, <laughs> I would say that um, it's one thirty, um, and I would like to thank both of our speakers again for joining us today and for the very nice talks and for making my job so easy today and um, this is actually the last cosmology lunch um, before the holidays so if we don't see each other anymore um, happy holidays to everyone and see you in 2022 thank you so much bye everyone and thanks again bye bye, bye, -bye. thank bye. you